Good morning. What a wonderful time of worship together. If you have your Bible, please open it with me to Luke chapter 1, and a message I'm calling a remarkable woman. Now, I want to say a word about next Sunday uh, to start things off. Next Sunday is Christmas, Christmas Day, and uh, we get to celebrate together. It's not often that Christmas lands on a Sunday, but when we when it does, we found it's a very special time of worship as a church family. Uh, we have something special planned next week. Uh, we're having family Christmas at our church, which means all the kids are invited, right? Uh, we're inviting you to bring your kids to worship with us. We'll have uh, Sunday school for kids, babies through kindergarten, but I think it's a great opportunity for our kids to sit with us next week in worship on Christmas Day, showing them the priority and the blessing of worshiping together as a church family. We're going to have something special in store for them in the service, uh, so your kids aren't going to want to miss it, all right? Now, I've had a number of people ask me if I thought very many people would actually show up to church on Christmas, and I was kind of offended at the question at first, but, but I understand. Uh, I understand the question, and my hope And my expectation is, yes, people will show up to church on Christmas Sunday. Now, obviously, there'll be some that will be out of town, or maybe some have grown sick, uh, but I expect a lot of people to show up to church to celebrate the birth of our Lord. Uh, Our people come to church on Easter. We don't trade, uh, you know, the resurrection for the Easter bunny. I don't think we're going to trade the birth of Christ for Santa Claus or presents or whatever it might be, all right? So... I hope to see you next Sunday if you're in town, all right, Uh, for Christmas uh, worship as a family together. All right. Now, to this morning's passage out of Luke chapter 1, there's a lot that we could narrow in on in the verses that we're going to be looking at. Uh, One message couldn't possibly contain all that's here. So I want to focus in on one person in the story, Mary the mother of Jesus, the most famous woman perhaps who's ever lived, rivaled only by Eve. Now, why did God choose Mary? How did she respond? And what do we learn from her response? I I want us to kind of take a look at her faith as a model for you and I. What do we learn from this remarkable woman in this encounter? Mary was used in an extraordinary way by God. And though none of us are going to have, you know, give birth to the Son of God, uh, I think all of us as His children, we also want to be used in an extraordinary way. So what do we learn from her? Let's look, beginning in verse number 26, we read, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, Mary's probably 13 or 14 years old at this point. She's betrothed to Joseph. She's not yet married to him. Marriages in those days were arranged by the parents. And I've got two teenagers right there, and I'm thinking we should bring this back. What do you guys say? If we all go in together, maybe we could, you know, change the culture so we can pick our kid's spouse. That would be great. Well, betrothal was very similar to an engagement. It lasted about a year's time. It was a time in which a young man and a young woman began operating just a little bit like a married couple without the commitment of marriage and without sexual intimacy. So Mary is a very young girl still under her parents' house, living in Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a small country town in the north of Israel in the region of Galilee. It was an insignificant place. In fact, later in Jesus' ministry, he called Philip and Nathanael to be his disciples, and Nathanael famously said, can anything good come from Nazareth? In other words, Jesus, Messiah from Nazareth, he, he, could, he didn't get it, right? It'd be like someone from Bakersfield saying, can anything good come from Taft or Maricopa or Tupman or, you know, you name the place, right? Here's the principle we see. God often does significant things 
in, in insignificant places so he gets the glory. <laughs> you look at history. It's amazing how often this happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. God chooses Mary while she's living in this little known, insignificant country town of Nazareth. God passes over Rome, which had political power. He passes over Athens, which was known as the intellectual capital of the world. He passes over Jerusalem, which is the center of religious life. Instead, he shows it to Mary in this little, what could be thought of as a hick town, the town of Nazareth. Excuse me. <clears throat> Nazareth uh, it wasn't really known for anything except a bunch of ordinary people, <laughs> common people. Bakersfield is famous for, you know, Buck Owens and the Bakersfield Sound, and we're not famous for a lot beyond that. I mean, we were, you know, featured in a movie, though, one time, the movie Cast Away. I don't know if you guys remember that with Tom Hanks. An outhouse, a piece of an outhouse, a porta potty floats ashore and has Bakersfield written on it, right? That's kind of our claim to fame in Hollywood, a lot of people think of Bakersfield that way as an insignificant place. I happen to believe that God plans to do significant, meaningful, world-impacting work in this little place called Bakersfield. Because God loves to take insignificant people from insignificant places and use them in significant ways. People like you and I, ordinary people. Now why does he do that? So that he gets all the glory. In 1972, there was a little, little church out in the middle of nowhere, out in the country, a little community called Lake Creek. And that church took a group of teenagers to a Christian camp. And there were two young, wild, rebellious teenage boys who joined them. And the last night of that church camp, God grabbed a hold of their hearts and radically changed their lives. Now, those two young teenage boys grew up to be our senior pastors for the last 37 years. My dad and Pastor Phil. God loves taking insignificant people in insignificant places and using them in mighty ways. My family, this past Easter, the Sunday before Easter, we went on vacation to Oklahoma, and we visited that little church, Lake Creek Baptist Church, and uh, we worshiped with them on Sunday. We have a picture of it right there just outside the church. I showed this picture for what's on the bottom of it, uh, but you can't really see. It says, organized 1888. That little church in the middle of, it's like in the middle of nowhere, has been a bright light in this world since 1888. Now, we were hanging out with some people after church uh, a little bit longer than most everyone else, and uh, the pastor started to leave. And I was kind of sensitive to what, you know, he was in charge. And so I said, hey, do we need to get out of here? Are you trying to lock up? And he said, no, these doors never lock. They stay open day and night. <laughs> and I thought to myself, wow, maybe that's why God has blessed them and used them so mightily through all of these years. Sometimes God uses insignificant people in significant places, and he uses them in mighty ways so that he gets all of the credit. Do not fall into the trap of thinking, I'm just a nobody from Bakersfield. You're not a nobody, you're God's somebody. God wants to use you, he wants to use me, he wants to use all of us, not in little ways, in, in, in big ways. Look at verse number 28, we pick up the story. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And consider what manner of greeting this was. This word highly favored, the, the angel Gabriel says she is, it means pursued by grace. You see, God has set his eyes on Mary and Gabriel's letting her know about it. Now, when most people think about angels, they kind of picture some, you know, little fat, chubby uh, baby with wings, and that, that's terrifying, honestly, to me. But, uh, <clears throat> but an angel wasn't some little fat baby with wings. An angel is a powerful and majestic creature. Every time an angel appeared to a person in the Bible, they had to say, fear not, 
because the natural reaction to seeing an angel is fear. But Mary's first reaction, believe it or not, doesn't seem to be fear. It seems to be a troubled confusion. She's processing here out loud uh, to the angel, or it's telling us how she's processing actually what the angel has said. I think she's thinking, you know, what is going on here? I don't deserve all this, all this blessing. You're highly favored. All, what, what, is, what is going on? Here's the principle for you and I. Sometimes we're slow to receive God's blessings because they seem too good to be true. Sometimes it takes some processing, right? The forgiveness of God, all the awful things we've done in our life, God just wants to forgive us. The restoration he, he offers, where our lives are broken, he offers to restore and to heal us. The peace he offers, where our lives are filled with turmoil and relationships, and uh, he offers peace. God offers all of those blessings in a moment, but sometimes we're, we're a little slow to embrace them as ours. I think because we know we don't deserve them, and so we're, it is, it's hard to make sense of it. You see, understanding grace is sometimes a bit of a process. We receive it in a moment, but we've got to let it sink in, right? What does this mean? What does this actually mean? I think Mary was processing here. She's thinking, I, what did I possibly do to deserve this? I'm a little troubled by what this announcement. This is a big announcement. Let's say that this afternoon I'm resting uh, at home before tonight's Lord's Supper service. And all of a sudden, let's say that the Secret Service show up in my room and they say, the President of the United States highly favors you. You are blessed among Americans. I'd be a little troubled by that, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> confused and troubled. Perhaps a little skeptical about what's actually going on. Why are they really here, right? What in the world is going on? I think that was Mary just a little bit. She's a little bit troubled and confused by just the abruptness of this whole thing that she's highly favored and blessed. What, what exactly does this mean? Now, have you ever had an experience in your life where you thought about the blessings of God in your life, of what he promises us, and you have the thought that, man, that just seems too good to be true. Why would God Almighty show me that kind of love? and that kind of grace. I've been there before. Because so much in life is about achievement and reciprocal expectations, right? I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine kind of mentality, right? But God doesn't have that mentality. That's not the way that God operates. God just blesses us. We don't deserve it. He just does it. Mary hadn't done anything special to deserve God's favor or blessing. She didn't achieve God's favor, she received God's favor. God simply ch decided to choose her to bless her out of the goodness of his heart. And it's the same with us. You and I are the same way. No one ever does something, you know, so spectacular that God said, Look, you know, wow, you're awesome. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some favor. No, 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 that's, that's not how it works. In fact, it's the exact opposite. None of us deserve it. Look at Romans chapter three, verse nine. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Am I somehow better than the, 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 than the rest? Because God you know, chose to make me a pastor? No, not at all. Is Mary better than, than the rest of us? No, not at all. She's like all of us, a sinner in need of God's unmerited, unearned favor. Now, I'm not slighting Mary here. Please, don't, don't hear me wrong. Mary was a remarkable woman, perhaps the greatest woman who's ever lived. The Bible says that, that, that all generations will call her blessed. We shouldn't deify Mary, but we should honor her, absolutely honor her, because God chose her. He looked down upon her, and he chose her, and in her humility, she said yes to him. You see, Mary wasn't in it for Mary. Mary was in it for God. Here's the principle. 
Remarkable people are remarkable because they know they're not that remarkable. Does that make sense? I hope you'd follow that. The most significant and remarkable Christians are those who realize there's really nothing remarkable about them except for the favor of God. Special people know they're not really the ones that are special. God is. Now, I'm not talking about special athletes. They think they're special normally. Or special, you know, businessmen or special politicians. They like to tell us how great they are. Uh, but I, I don't think that, you know, the ability to throw a, a, a football makes a person remarkable. It doesn't make them special of, unless they play for Oklahoma Sooners, of course. But, uh, <laughs> no, really, I mean, no ability to throw a football or a baseball makes someone special. It makes them a good athlete. But, but a special person is, is a person who, who recognizes there's nothing special except for God has blessed me. That was Mary. We should learn from her. Now, there's some in the world today that worship Mary. They see her as a co-mediator uh, with Christ. And I think Mary would be horrified by that. Look what she says in Luke chapter 1, verse number 48. For he, that's the Lord, has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. She's saying, people are going to call me blessed. Why? Because God has regarded me a lowly main servant. He's chosen to bless me. God is responsible. God gets the credit. God gets the glory. God doesn't get glory from people who are proud and arrogant as Christians. A proud and arrogant Christian is just like, it's like, it's an oxymoron. Because a Christian, by definition, is someone who's humbled themselves someone who's realized and admitted and confessed, they don't deserve any of God's favor. They only deserve his judgment. But they humbly trust Christ to do for them that which they could not do on their own. We are to be like Mary, humble before God, to recognize any, anything spectacular, special about you, me. It's all credit to the Lord. It's a gift. It's like the kid who gets a a new bike for Christmas, and he tells his friends in the neighborhood about how special he is because he has this awesome new bike, and his friends say, well, that bike doesn't make you special. Your parents gave you that bike. And he says, I know, and that's what makes you special. The truth is, we, we are special. Not because of what we've done, though, because we're all sinners. We're special because God has declared us special. We're special because God has chosen to love us and show us his favor and his blessing. And oh, when we understand that, we live with a different sense, a different mentality. It's important to recognize that. Now let's pick up the story in verse number 30. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. What an incredible announcement. Now someday I want to preach an entire message just on these verses, because we could unpack them for weeks, right? The angel tells Mary, She's going to have a son that's going to be great. He's going to be famous. He's going to be called the son of the highest, which means he's the son of God. He's going to reign on, his, on the throne of David forever and ever. And you know, you know what? That's exactly what her son did. He reigned. He reigns. He's the son of the highest, the son of God. God, she gave birth to the son of God. He's going to reign on the throne of David forever. He's going to be king of Israel but more expansively, the king over the whole world. That's who we celebrate this Christmas. Do not forget, that's why we celebrate Christmas, that God Almighty became a baby. The infinite took on the finite. The eternal God took on flesh and blood so that he could die in our place. He could rescue us. He is our savior. Now at this point in the story, I think it's starting to click for Mary. <laughs> She's starting to begin to understand a little bit more of the significance of the moment she is in because she knew God's word. 
Later in chapter one, we read a, this beautiful song that Mary wrote in the aftermath of this encounter. And she quotes in that song from the book of Genesis, First and Second Samuel, Psalms, Job, Micah. You see, Mary had the word of God hidden in her heart. So when the angels promised what, what, what he promised, I'm sure her mind was racing all the way back to Genesis chapter three, the seed of the woman. Then the seed of Abraham, the seed of, uh, of Isaac, the seed of Jacob in Genesis. Her mind probably went to 2 Samuel chapter seven, where there's a coming son of David that's promised who will reign forever and there will be no end to his kingdom. So her mind, right, at this point, the angel has her undivided attention, but she's still confused, and rightfully so. Look at verse number 34. It says, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? Now that's a legitimate question, right? The angel's just told her, you're gonna give birth to a, to a baby, even though she's never slept with a man. That doesn't line up with the real world, how it works, does it? Mary knows that. So she asks the question, how? Here's the principle. It is healthy to humbly ask God questions when we don't understand. Some people think, no, no, no. Some people think it's a lack of faith to question God. Sometimes it is, but not always. It really depends on the posture of our heart when we question him. Look at with me uh, in just a moment here, earlier in Luke chapter one, the angel Gabriel shows up, before he shows up to Mary, he shows up to Zacharias, who would be the father of John the Baptist. Gabriel told uh, Zacharias that his son would grow, he would be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he would pave the way for the coming Messiah. Let's look what transpired in Luke chapter one, verse 18. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. By the way, Zacharias had prayed for this. Okay, keep that in mind. And the angel answered and said to him, am, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Zacharias and Elizabeth, they had prayed for a child. <laughs> and their response is to question. Now look at Gabriel's response to Mary. In verse 34, we see her question. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I don't know a man? Verse 35, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. We see two different questions in the same chapter to the same angel, Gabriel. Zacharias, he's mute. He, there's a judgment on his question. For Mary, she just gets more information, and she's more blessed. You say, that's kind of messed up. Why did Gabriel respond to Zacharias in a different way than he did to Mary. I think it was because of the posture of Zacharias' heart was clearly different than Mary's. This is something they should have been expecting and praying for, and finally God shows up and answers, and now they're like, how's that gonna work? Some questions are honest and genuine, but other questions, they're proud and defiant. Some questions are, are asked with actually a closed mind. They're, they're not really questions of faith, they're questions of disbelief. What? How's that possible? Why, God, how could you possibly do that in kind of an accusatory way? Mary's question is very different, though. It comes from a genuine place of humble curiosity. How can this be? I don't understand, Lord, is what's going on in her heart. I'm ready, though, for you to teach me. Explain, please, help me understand. See, it's okay to question God when we don't understand. In fact, I think it's very appropriate. It's an act of faith as long as we do so with humility. Now, we know, though, and we should all realize that not every time we question God does he answer us in the way that, that we want, right? We like all the details, and God doesn't always give us the details. The prophet Habakkuk 
faced a situation where the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, they were prospering, yet they were a wicked people. And the Israelites were suffering under their wickedness. And so Habakkuk says, why God? Why? And God answers him. And God's answer is, he says, the just, that is the righteous. The righteous shall live by his faith. In other words, trust me. Trust me. Just trust me. The most important question I've learned to ask God during times of confusion and pain, it's not why, although I've asked that question. It's, Lord, what are you teaching me? What do you want me to learn? Sometimes I've asked the question why, but but I'm not sure our minds can understand the details. I'm not sure we see the whole, we don't see enough of the picture, right? Right? God knows what we're capable of handling. God knows what we need to know and when we need to know it. Habakkuk wanted to know the specifics, and God didn't give him the specifics. Instead, he just said, trust me. The righteous, they're going to live by faith. Trust me. Over the last few years, I've had several significant moments of uncertainty in my life. And the most fruitful thing I've learned to do is just to talk very honestly and transparently and openly with the Lord about it. Father, I don't understand, but I trust you. This hurts really bad. This is really scary, but I trust you. I I don't see how all this adds up in your plan of why this could be good, but Lord, I trust you. Father, what are you teaching me in this moment? I want to learn. I I don't want to go through this same lesson. (laughs) I want to come on on the other side of this lesson stronger than I was before. I want to become more like your son Jesus than I was before this lesson came about. I want to be more like like your son. Help me, Lord. That changes the the whole mindset. It changes the heart. All of that. Now, what if our questions do come from doubt, though? What if they're seeded in doubt. Should we still ask those kind of questions? And I believe we should. Absolutely, yes. When you doubt, whatever you're doubting, tell the Lord about it. Go to him. He has the answers, right? Ask him for help. It's like the man who encountered Jesus, and he said, Lord, I, I believe. Help my unbelief. Sometimes we need to be like that man. Lord, I believe you. Help my unbelief. Those doubts I have, Lord, help me doubt those doubts. Help me believe what I know to be true. I found that God meets his children who are doubting who come to him with those doubts. He meets us and he builds our faith as we seek him in those moments. Now, the last thing that the angel Gabriel said to Mary is one of the most profound and beautiful statements in all the word of God. Verse 37 Gabriel says, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Let that sink in for just a moment. Here's the principle. Nothing is impossible when God is involved. Amen? Amen. That means everything is possible when God is involved. Now, this is a statement about God that we should remind ourselves continually of. God has the answers. God has the power. God has the ability. God has the knowledge. God has all the, nothing's impossible with him. Mary was given a promise that she's going to have a son. She's a virgin. Gabriel says, don't worry too much about that. With God, nothing's impossible. You know, we face impossible situations in our life, don't we? We face impossible situations every day. A marriage that can't possibly be healed and restored. Oh, God does the impossible. A child that can't possibly be salvaged. Oh, God does the impossible. An addict who's tried and tried and tried. Said, I've done everything I can. It's impossible. Listen, God specializes in doing the impossible. We face impossible situations all the time. But they're only impossible for us. We realize that? Do you realize that? They're not impossible for God. I want to encourage you, when you face impossible situations in your life, whatever it might be, take it to the Lord, get them involved. And when you do, watch out. 
See how he works. He does amazing things. You see, God, he wants to deal with the impossibilities of your life. What are they? God wants to deal with them. Now, let's look at Mary's response. What she said in verse 38 is a beautiful response. She said, behold, or it says, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What a beautiful statement. Here's the principle. The greatest blessings in the Christian life come from being submitted to God. His will above our own. Mary doesn't respond with, hey, I'm only like 13 years old. She didn't say that. She didn't say, oh, what's Joseph going to say? What's Joseph going to do? What are my parents going to think? There's no record in the Bible of Gabriel going and warning her mom and dad. What's that conversation look like, right? Can you imagine? Mom and dad, I, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is I'm pregnant. The good news is I'm having the son of God. Right? How's that going to go down? I mean, really, how would it go down for you? She doesn't allow all of those questions to keep her from making this statement. She doesn't push back at all. Instead, she says, let it be to me according to your word. Can you say that with honest transparency before the living God? What a sweet place of complete, utter dependence on the Lord. Complete trust in him. Now, I'm sure she had some of those questions in the back of her mind, but those questions took a backseat to her faith. Let it be to me according to your word, O God. And maybe the Lord is doing something in your heart on something very specific. Maybe it's real clear in the word of God, but maybe it's, maybe it's more general. He's tugging at you in some application of his word. If you'll just say that, it will revolutionize your life. It will simplify your life. One big statement, your life will be filled with such peace. Maybe it's something specific. Perhaps you need to be more active in approaching the celebration of the birth of Christ this Christmas. Maybe you're tempted to get distracted by all the things it's not about. <laughs> all the, the wrappings of Christmas. And maybe the Lord is placing it on your heart. I need, and I, my family, we need to be more intentional about putting Jesus at the center of Christmas this year. Okay, if the God's doing that, here's what you need to say. Let it be to me according to your word. Not my way, but your way. Maybe you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend and the Lord has been tugging on your heart about that. And maybe you're scared. You're afraid to, to, to turn from that sin and to trust the Lord because you don't know where you're gonna stay. You don't know the financial ramifications for that. Let it be to me according to your word. God will show up. He will meet you. He will take care of you. Mary had stepped off of the throne of her heart and she had let God step on her throne, that throne instead, in her place. Now, how Mary responded any other way we would not be talking about her this morning, would we? She wouldn't even be a footnote in history. But she did respond. She responded with trust. I have found that's where God's greatest blessings are found. To say, I, I bow my knee to you. That's not how I would do it. <laughs> I don't think Mary would have wrote, written the script this way. Let it be to me according to your word. Now as we wrap up, there's a lot we can learn from the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. A lot of takeaways. We haven't even barely scratched the surface. But let us not forget the central figure of the Christmas story. It's not Mary. It's Mary's son. It's Jesus. He's at the center of Christmas. He's at the center of the word of God. He's at the center of this universe. All things are done by him and for him. He is the central figure of all of history. What is your relationship with him? I heard about a Christian doctor who was asked one time, doctor, 
If you had a lady come to you and say, you know, I'm having a child, but I'm a virgin. This is going to be a virgin-born child. Would you believe her? I love how the doctor responded. He said, well, if that child grew up to live an absolute perfect life, and that child died, and three days later that child came back to life, yes, I would believe her. <laughs> Why do we believe that Mary was a virgin? It's because of her son. It's because of who she gave birth to. It's because of Jesus, everything in his life, even his death, oh, and yes, his resurrection, it all points to the reality of who he is. This, in fact, is the living son of God. God sent him into this world. Why? To rescue us, to save us, to redeem us, to purchase us, to love us. Now, here's the best news of all today that the same Jesus who was born of a virgin on that very first Christmas can be born in your heart in a moment. He does not have to be some distant figure of the past that lived 2,000 years ago and changed all of human history. He doesn't have to be that. He wants to be born in you. In the way that he is born in you, Jesus referred to it as being born again of the Spirit, born again. The way that happens is very simple. Faith. Trust. In a moment, to be like Mary, to trust God above yourself. You know, we'll never really appreciate the Christmas story until we approach it with childlike faith. Like a child trusts his daddy, <laughs> just not having all the answers, he just trusts him. We don't have all the answers. Mary didn't have all the answers. She just trusted. Now, I'm not asking you to ch check your brains at the door, right? I'm asking you to rationally consider the evidence and then to listen to the Holy Spirit who's speaking to your heart and to trust Jesus.